Welcome everyone to this LVFO webinar. Today's session uh, will be presented by uh, PhD student Alexander Macmillan. It will be on modular microfluidics for chemistry using a soft thermoplastic elastomer. Just so you know a little bit more about LVFO, it is a startup company that specialized in microfluidic instrumentation and located in Paris. Our mission is to help researchers uh, go beyond the state of the art by developing microfluidic instruments. LVFO is also actively involved in international collaboration to develop microfluidic solutions for research and the industry. If you have any questions after uh, the end of this presentation, you can ask them in the YouTube comments or email us at contact at lvfo.com. Now, Alex. Hello everybody, thank you for joining for this webinar on modular microfluidics for chemistry using a soft thermoplastic elastomer. This will consist of the work uh, I've been doing during my PhD here at LV6. And just to outline the presentation, um, first I'll give a brief introduction of microfluidics for chemistry, including the advantages we could use, um, gain by using microfluidics, as well as some bottlenecks in its development. Then we'll move on to a new class of materials called soft thermoplastic elastomers, which could provide potential solutions. I'll talk about the characterization and microfabrication of one particular soft thermoplastic elastomer called Fluoroflex and its implementation in a modular microfluidic device. And I'll finish off with some conclusions and outlook. First off, uh, start talking about microfluidics for chemistry. Um, we could talk about the advantages that we gain by using microfluidics in general, by um, using microchannels. Um, we have uh, high surface area to volume ratios, high mass and heat transport. And what that does for us is it decreases our sample reagent and reagent consumption. It reduces the experiment time and cost. It also allows us to control our marker environment with high precision and implement high automation and parallelization. And what this gives us in biology research is the, uh, it allows us to recreate complex in vivo environments. Um, we could develop high throughput and parallelized assays, and we could perform complex operations such as cell encapsulation, sorting, and confinement. And while for chemistry, microfluidics hasn't taken off in the same way as it has for in biology. We could still take advantage of these uh, aspects for the beneficial increased uh, chemistry research. So what that could do is uh, we could increase our reaction selectivity and speed, we could decrease our waste and energy input, and we could also develop high throughput reaction optimization. And what that results in is more efficient, sustainable, and potentially low cost chemistry using microfluidics. However, there have been a number of bottlenecks in the development of microfluidics for chemistry, one of which is the selection of materials. There is a need for new materials in microfluidics. As you can see from this diagram, there is a large selection of materials we could use to create microfluidic devices. However, each material comes with their distinct advantages and drawbacks. So now if we focus on the most common microfluidic material, PDMS, it's an elastomer, and we'll have a look at uh, some of the advantages and drawbacks. PDMS, um, polydimethyl siloxane, is the most co currently common microfluidic polymer uh, material out there, it's particularly for biology applications. Um, that's because it's highly transparent, it's relatively inexpensive and easy to fabricate using the soft lithography uh, fabrication method shown on the right, developed in the late 1990s. Uh, it's biocompatible, it's very important for biology, and it's easily deformable, making it uh, easy to handle and work with. However, there are a number of very important drawbacks that we see with BDMS. One is that uh, while the fabrication of soft lithography is quite easy, it's not easily scalable, meaning for uh, at low production uh, situations, such as in research labs where you're making a small amount of chips, um, this is feasible. But once you start talking about hundreds or even thousands of chips, um, which would be necessary for uh, industrial implementation, for example, the soft lithography process isn't well suited to that. In addition, it absorbs a number of small molecules into the bulk of the material, which is very problematic for applications like drug testing, as well as many chemical reactions. And another uh, drawback for, specifically for chemistry is that PDMS is incompatible with many organic solvents, meaning uh, when, in, when put in contact with these organic solvents, such as toluene or hexane, chloroform, for example, the material, the material will swell and the device will often be destroyed, making it impossible to use uh, for many chemical reactions. 
Now, one potential solution that has more recently emerged is a class of materials called soft thermoplastic elastomers. First of all, what is a soft thermoplastic elastomer? As the name suggests, uh, it's a thermoplastic like PMMA, polycarbonate and polystyrene, meaning that at room temperature and cold te gold, colder temperatures, um, it's a solid, but at elevated temperatures, we could melt it and mold it. However, unlike these hard thermoplastics, it's soft, so it's low stiffness and elastic, similar to PDMS. One example of a recently developed STPE uh, is called Flexteam from a company called Eden Microfluidics, um, which has been shown to possess a number of fabrication advantages over, over PDMS. Um, we could use a fabrication process called hot embossing, by which we uh, take, if we look on the left panel of the image there, take a, a sheet of the polymer, um, put it against a, a microfluidic mold, and using a backplate and heat and pressure um, with a, at the heat press shown in the middle image, um, we could essentially melt the polymer uh, against the microfluidic mold, imprinting it with micro channels. On the right image, we see a, a sheet of flex steam, which has been hot embossed against the microfluidic mold. It's then being peeled off with its micro channels. After hot embossing, the material can be self bonded, meaning there's no need for plasma activation or adhesives. Simple conformal contact between two layers um, with some baking is sufficient to achieve bonds. And what this results in is there's very little sophisticated equipment needed for this process, making it very inexpensive and easily transferable. And what I mean by that is that due to the fact that it's a thermoplastic, we have the potential to use fabrication methods such as roll-to-roll -roll hot embossing and injection molding that have been uh, widespread in industry for a long time. Um, but we could also easily fabricate at small scales, meaning we can transfer between the research and industrial scale seamlessly with the same material. And while this particular material that I've been talking about, Flexteam, is, has been shown to be good for biology, um, not so much for chemistry. It's uh, still a problem of solvent compatibility. Solvent, organic solvents will still swell and actually dissolve this material. So there's been a new STP, um, recently, more recently developed with little characterization, called Fluoroflex. It's actually a soft thermoplastic fluoroelastomer, meaning there are fluorine and carbon chains. Um, so my uh, PhD work has been consisting of material characterization, microfabrication development, and microfluidic demonstration in the form of modular microfluidics. So when we're talking about material characterization, again, the, the, the important thing here is solvent compatibility. So will this Fluoroflex material uh, withstand organic solvents? And how do we actually evaluate the solvent compatibility? We could use a simple test, a swelling evaluation, whereby we take a solid piece of, of the polymer itself, and we measure the dimensions, we immerse it in a bath of uh, a, a given organic solvent, wait 24 hours, and we measure it again. And any dimensional changes will be representative of solvent swelling. So for, in this case, the example here, we have a, the polymer has swelled twice its size, we get a swelling ratio of two. Now, if we have a look at this list of very common organic solvents and put it against the swelling ratios found for fluoroflex, as well as the swelling ratios known for PDMS, we see the swelling ratios in green are low to moderate swelling solvents, meaning we can probably use these materials with these solvents. Um, and the swelling ratios in red are those that highly swell the materials. So they will often destroy devices if put in contact with them. And we, we could see right away that while Fluoroflex isn't completely uh, resistant to all solvents, um, it is a significantly improved solvent resistance compared to PDMS, especially in the non-polar solvent, very common non-polar solvents, such as hexane, uh, toluene, benzene, and chloroform, which are very important for a lot of chemistry. So less swelling in Fluoroflex, that essentially means higher solvent compatibility. Now we'll quickly go over some other key important characterization steps done to evaluate how well this material could be used for microfluidics. One is that it's highly optically transparent. We see a, a UV vis transmission spectra here, um, where it's transparent down to the near UV ranges. This is very important for observation of the microchannel, as well as potential photochemistry applications where we want to irradiate things inside the channel. It has hydrophobic surface behavior, quite similar to PDMS, meaning that uh, looking at this contact angle measurement of a water droplet. And this is useful for predicting the um, flow regimes that would be possible inside of a microfluidic channel. And on the right, we could see uh, a rhodamine B absorption assay. Um, Fluoroflex exhibits very low absorption compared to PDMS. 
on the top row, uh, we have a PDMS channel on the left and a Floriflex channel on the right, filled with a rhodamine B uh, solution. Rhodamine B is a, a common small fluorescent molecule. And left, these channels have been left for 24 hours. On the bottom row, we see both the channels after washing with water. And on the left, you see the PDMS channel has highly absorbed the rhodamine B, still fluorescent even without the solution. Whereas the Floriflex channel on the right has comparatively very little absorption, which is important for, as I mentioned before, drug testing and maintaining chemical concentrations in uh, chemical reactions. Now, how do we actually make this Floriflex material into a device? So we start in this form of pellets, the polymer pellets, and we put it atop a smooth and flat, rigid counterplate. Here's a metallic plate. We then put a microfluidic mold atop the pellets. Here we can see a uh, example mold. It's a dry film photoresist mold on a glass slide. We are only using half of the mold here in this example. We place the assembly um, in the heat press, which is essentially uh, two opposing hot plates heated to 220 degrees, which can be um, brought together. And we press it at 120, 220 degrees um, for about 30 seconds. Afterwards, you see that the polymer pellets have melted into a sheet um, against the mold, after which we can simply peel off the sheet, um, which is now micro powdered with the channels from the mold. And all this can be done in about two minutes, which is a significant improvement on the time required for fabrication of other uh, microfluidic materials, including PDMS, which can take anywhere from two hours to 48 hours for, uh, for curing, curing of the material. And what this results in is very rapid fabrication, reliable molding, and good resolution and fidelity. On the right, we can see some profilometer images uh, showing images of 70 micron channels with which we had resolutions of around two or three microns, which is significant, which is uh, sufficient for the vast majority of microfluidic applications. So then to actually create a device, once we have a micro padded floor flex sheet, we need something to actually seal the channel, like we might use a glass slide to seal a PDMS device. We could use, instead of a glass slide, um, we're going to be using the self-sealing uh, mechanism of this Floriflex by using just another plain Floriflex sheet to seal it. What we could do is punch a few holes at the inlets and outlets of the Floriflex sheet, and then simply bring the two into conformal contact. And uh, this is enough to achieve bonding, um, similar to FlexSteam. So without the need for any adhesives or plasma activation, which represent um, additional steps in the, in the workflow. And most importantly, this, this bond is completely reversible, meaning we can unbond, we can peel apart the, the two layers and rebond them without any degradation of bonding strength. Um, uh, this contrasts sharply with that of PDMS, for example, PDMS uh, glass plasma bonding. It's an irreversible bond, meaning once they are in contact and bonded, we cannot take it apart without really destroying the device. And with this type of bonding, we, can, we have got a few options. We could bake it for two hours at 185 degrees. With that, we could get a pressure bonding strength of over four bar. Or at room temperature, just five minutes after putting the two layers in contact, we get a, a pressure rating of one, one and a half bar. Um, this is compared to glass PD mass bond, which is typically two to three bar. So both of these are more than sufficient for the vast majority of microfluidic applications. And critically, they are reversible. So they could be undone and redone um, as you want. So this fast, fully reversible bonding made us think, could this be used for microfluidics in which reconfiguring devices is uh, very interesting? First of all, we could, we could ask, what, is, what do we mean by microfluidics? Um, say modular microfluidics, say, say we have a set of modules, um, each designed for a specific fluid handling operation. We could have a straight channel module on the left um, that could be used for variable resistance by changing the, uh, the width of the channel. We could have a serpentine channel for resistance time or droplet mixing or viewing. We could have a T-junction channel, channel for simple droplet generation. And we could have a Y-junction channel for liquid coflow or two liquid injection. This is, this is only four very simple modules, but um, it can be envisioned to have a whole library of, of different modules for different fluid handling uh, purposes. And these could then be combined for customizable and interchangeable microfluidic operations at a very at a personalized level. So say we want to combine these two modules, a straight channel and a T-junction droplet generator to make droplets. We need some way of actually connecting them. We need some sort of manifold or base plate. 
That's what we see here on the left, a uh, schematic of a, uh, of a base plate or a module, a ma manifold for the modules. We have a set of microfluidic channels, as well as a space, two spaces for, for the two modules. We could see the red boxes indicate where we could place the modules, where they would line up with the, uh, with the microfluidic um, channels of the base plate, as well as the arrows indicating where we could actually interface the surrounding microfluidic uh, equipment with the base, with the module. So when we put the uh, modules onto the base plate, we could see here we're using uh, the two green arrows as inlets, and the one red arrow would be the outlet. So we'd be flowing into the straight channel, into the droplet generation phase of the T-junction, and we'd be getting our droplets out. Say, for example, we wanted to put mix two fluids into the droplet phase, we could swap the straight channel with the Y module channel, and then we could co-flow two fluids into the droplet phase and have a droplet consisting of two fluids. Or, for example, we could uh, flip around our, um, our T-junction droplet uh, module and then uh, follow it with a serpentine channel or droplet mixing or simple droplet uh, residence time or viewing. So this is what we wanted to demonstrate with Floroflex, taking advantage of the fact that we could achieve fast and reversible bonding so that this would allow us to switch out the modules as we wanted. And this is what we, uh, this is, this is what we resulted in here. Um, so here's a Floroflex modular platform. We could see the, the base plate consisting of a number of microfluidic channels that could be interfaced with the modules and the microfluidic tubing. And we have our two modules. We have our T-junction module and our, in the back and our straight channel module, which is actually being placed while the photograph is being taken. Um, with a pair of tweezers, you simply layer it on top of the base plate. And after five minutes, uh, the bond is, is ready to go and ready to be used. Then we have our uh, connectors. These are commercial nanoport connectors, which are fixed to the top of the Floroflex base plate. And finally, we just have a glass slide at the very bottom um, as a rigid support, because after all, this material is quite flexible. So we wanted to use this module to demonstrate droplet generation. And that's exactly what we did. So droplet generation, uh, water droplets in a toluene continuous phase using an elbow flow pressure controller. Um, first, we use a 100 micron T-junction module. And as you can see, we get water droplets in toluene of approximately 85 micron diameter. And then to demonstrate the modularity with the fast bonding and reversal bonding, we wanted to switch modules. So we simply peel off the 100 micron T-junction module and we, re and we replace it with the 250 micron T-junction module. And all that, the whole change can be done in under five minutes. And five minutes later, we are making droplets of about 120 microns. So without having to change the complete device. We could just have a set of modules ready and we could interchange them to achieve different microfluidic outcomes. And while this is just a, quite a simple demonstration, um, this, could, this gives scope for increasingly complex modules by adding more than two modules, having more than uh, three or four options, as I described before, for modules, as well as the scope for using this for actual chemical reactions. So you notice we use toluene as a continuous phase. This is a organic solvent, which highly swells PDMS. So this operation could not actually be done in PDMS and many other thermoplastics. So to conclude, um, microfluidics has been shown to be very advantageous for chemistry. However, there are a number of bottlenecks and specifically a need for new materials in microfluidics for chemistry. Now, soft thermoplastic elastomers, specifically one called Floroflex, provides a possible solution to this because of its chemical resistance and rapid microfabrication. The microfabrication gives scope for scaling up to industrial scales, which would be a very important um, outlooking to the future of a more widespread adoption of microfluidic techniques. We demonstrated a self-sealing modular microfluidic platform uh, in which we could uh, customize the device by combining and interchanging individual module units. This could be very useful for rapid prototyping situations as well as uh, more general chemistry applications uh, for chemical reactions. And uh, that's it. Um, if you need to implement microfluidics in your lab, uh, we do tell you, please get in touch. And we also have a number of white papers and application notes and reviews on our website um, for all your microfluidic applications. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'll pass it back to Julie. Thank you so much, Alex. So I hope that now everybody is ready for the Q&A session. It is going to last about 15 minutes. 
and it will be with our technical microfluidic expert, uh, Robin Oliveros. Now, back to you, Alex and Robin. Amazing. Um, yeah, are those swellings isotropic? Yeah. So um, the question is, are all these swellings isotropic? Uh, meaning, do, do the material, does the material swell uh, equally in all dimensions? And um, the answer is usually yes for polymer swelling. Uh, they will be isotropic. Um, it can start off non-isotropic, um, which is why we wanted to usually leave the materials in the solvents for 24 hours so that it could reach swelling equilibrium, after which all dimensions have swelled at the same, the same ratio. So a quick uh, question from Andrew. Uh, what kind of flow rate did you use in the droplet generation experiment? Uh, the flow rates, um, so they're not very low. So the, so the toluene continuous phase It'd probably be in the range of uh, uh, 20 to 30 microliters per minute. And then the, the water phase would be much, much lower, a few microliters per minute for the droplet generation. I'll just use the opportunity to let you know that we have released a couple of droplet generation uh, packs, application packs on our website, so you guys can have a look at it. It's not exactly related to exactly the same as Alex carried out uh, as the, the Alex of the experiment, the one that Alex used in his experiments, but uh, it can be reused for that. And what is the minimum resolution that can be achieved with fluoroflex compared to PDMS? So that's a good question. Um, so we didn't investigate um, below submicron resolutions. However, when we're talking about thermoplastics, um, we generally don't necessarily talk about minimum resolution because finally we, we end up melting the polymer into a liquid. So um, it can theoretically go down to the submicron into the nanometer resolution. Um, however, uh, then it becomes more of a question of the, the material and mold interaction, as well as the mold aspect ratio. So um, in theory, it could be certainly submicron. Um, we, we showed uh, a, a, few, a few microns, um, but uh, yes, and PEMS is a similar case, right? So. Any more questions? One question from Benjamin. Uh, how does the material is able to withdraw four bar of pressure in steel be peeled off? Uh, that's a good question. So yeah, so with baking, you can achieve quite high, high pressure, pressure capacities of four bar. Um, and in fact, uh, you could still peel it off by hand, um, take a pair of tweezers and, and just simply pull it apart. It's, it's harder than with room temperature bonding. But the difference with PDMS is, um, you can still peel a piece of PDMS off of glass, but in fact, you'll end up tearing the PDMS. So, right, so the, so the bonding uh, isn't, uh, the interface bonding isn't any weaker than the material of the bulk itself. Um, so that's the difference between fluoroflex and PDMS is when you, when you peel the, peel the fluoroflex apart, it will separate half the interface into the two layers again. Can you fabricate multi-layer structures? Um, yeah, so uh, I, didn't, I didn't show that in my work, but um, there's, there should be no reason why multi-layered structures or using multi-layered molds or more complex 3D molds could be used. Um, it, again, it's a thermoplastic, so um, a number of different methods could be used to melt it down and to, to kind of form it with a number of different molds. Next question. Mm -hmm. Hello, what about glass microfluidic devices? Okay, so that's a good question. So glass microfluidic devices, I didn't mention very much, but currently they are probably the most used material for flow chemistry, uh, microfluidic chemistry, exactly because PDMS isn't very solvent resistant. Solvent resistant. However, for glass microfluidics, um, the actual fabrication process is much more intensive than for the thermoplastics. In addition to being just more expensive for uh, the material cost, the fabrication is usually done by wet etching, which involves harsh chemicals, hydrofluoric acid or potassium chloride or potassium uh, chloride, I think, um, which is pretty inaccessible to many small labs um, to handle these, these, these processes. And it's very expensive for the waste cleanup, for example. So glass microfluidic devices, it's more of a fabrication and cost issue as opposed to performance because they perform very well. Another question from Mitra. Uh, thank you very much for the webinar. What is the present challenges for nanoparticles separators like biomolecules using microfluidic devices? Hmm, that's uh, not really my field, but um, 
present challenge for nanoparticle separation like biomolecules using microwave devices. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I could tell you the present challenges in the field. Um, I know it'll be a, uh, probably a question of like the handling, yeah. liquid handling and challenges. Regarding the nanoparticle, uh, everything that relates to nanoparticles, we made a webinar around that not long ago. I think that was what a few months back. So you suggest you to have a look at it. And if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we, so we can put you in touch with uh, one of our nanoparticle experts. Uh, you can contact us at contact.elgoflow.com and we're happy to help you with this. Yeah. Any more question? Uh, one question from Lisa. Thanks, Alex. Uh, can you bind a semi-permeable membrane to fluoroflex? If not, could you pattern fluoroflex into a thin semi-permeable layer to be bondable to other layers? Mm -hmm. So for the first part of the question, can, I, can we bond a semi-permeable membrane um, to fluoroflex? Uh, this is a good question. I, I have not tried to bond other materials to fluoroflex. So obviously fluoroflex bonds really well to itself, but the fact that it's um, a fluoropolymer, um, the kind of interaction with other materials would be quite low. So it might, that might be quite tricky to find another material that will readily bond to it. Um, but a fluoroflex membrane would be possible. So I've gone down to, uh, pressing membranes of about 100 micron thickness. It's not very thin, and it certainly wasn't uh, perforated. It wasn't semi-permeable. Um, but you could for, uh, foreseeably um, try to microfabricate um, a uh, thin thin membrane with uh, with pores, but it's not something I've, I've tried. And it should be able to bond to the fluoroflex as well. See, yeah, this question can be very well related to organ and chips, but for instance... Yeah, for sure. So it's interesting because... Um, I was talking mostly about fluoroflex in the context of chemistry, but the fact that it doesn't absorb uh, small molecules, it could also be useful for, for biology. I um, mean, investigating the kind of biocompatibility and how well cells can be cultured onto it would be something to be really, would be really interesting. But, yeah, on culture, like to try. culture and thin membranes is definitely something interesting. Yeah, and it's, it's stretchable as well. Um, and uh, so it could, could be very interesting. Any more questions? Well, if you I think we're all set, so yeah, I think so. Thank you very much, guys, for your time. And uh, again, if you have any more questions, you can still contact us at contact.elbflot.com, and either me or Alex will get back to you if you if we can help. Yep. Have a good one. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.